if I were to describe my father, I would say that he was uh, the humanity in a human being. That he looked at all problems, he was deeply interested in all problems, anything that had to do with men and women and children. But he saw them always in a much larger context, in the context of the nation and the nation in the context of the world. And in himself, he combined all these. Being educated in rather a Western way, he had he was deeply influenced by Western culture and ideas. And yet, the more he was influenced, somehow the more Indian he became within himself and even uh, in, in his action and his, uh, his love for his country. He was um, deeply sensitive. In fact, I would say he was far more of a poet uh, than a politician. Someone has said that uh, out of a person's quarrels with society uh, comes out literature, but out of one's inner conflict comes out poetry. So I think in my father both these were there. There was the, the conflict with the status quo of society as well as the conflict uh, within himself. We were Kashmiris. Over 200 years ago, early in the 18th century, our ancestor came down from the mountain valley to seek fame and fortune in the rich plains below. Raj Kaur was the name of that ancestor of ours. He had gained eminence as a Sanskrit and Persian scholar in Kashmir. I was born in Allahabad on November the 14th, 1889. My 
father worked in the High Court. At an early age, he had established himself as a successful lawyer. He had taken firm grip of the ladder of success, not by anyone's favor, as he felt, but by his own will and intellect. I admired father tremendously. He seemed to me the embodiment of strength and courage and cleverness. When I was 10 years old, we changed over to a new and much bigger house, which my father named Anand Bhavan. Our house was far from being a lonely place, for it sheltered a large family of cousins and near relations. I saw much more of mother than I did of father, and she seemed nearer to me, and I would confide in her. My childhood was thus a sheltered and uneventful one. I listened to the grown-up talk of my cousins without always understanding all of it. Often this talk related to the overbearing character and insulting manner of the English people. Elizabeth gave a charter to the East India Company in 1600. The British came as freebooters, and their first period was a predatory one. This was followed by a more systematized method of extortion. The foreign trade of India was crushed. The most cruel and unscrupulous methods were used to kill flourishing Indian industries in order to find markets for British goods. In 1858, after the shock of the Indian Mutiny and Revolt, the East India Company transferred its domain of India to the British Crown. On the political side, the Indian National Congress was started in 1885. It was a very moderate body. The National Congress was just then attracting the attention of the English knowing middle class. And my father visited some of its early sessions and gave it a theoretical allegiance. In May 1905, when I was 15, we set sail for England. Father and mother, my baby sister and I, we all went together. I was a little fortunate in finding a vacancy at Harrow. Never before had I been left among strangers all by myself, and I felt lonely and homesick, but not for long. Father wrote to me, we leave you in flesh, but we'll always be with you in spirit. I never thought that I loved you so much as when I had to part with you. I have not the slightest doubt that you will rise to all my expectations and more. and stirred the whole of India. The British government divided up the great province of Bengal into two parts, one of these being Eastern Bengal. Eastern Bengal had a majority of Muslims, so by this division, a Hindu-Muslim question was also raised. A great anti-British movement rose in Bengal. The cry of Swadeshi was first raised then, and with it, the boycott of British goods. Side by side with it, there 
arose a school of revolutionary violence and a bomb first made its appearance in Indian politics. Cambridge, Trinity College, the beginning of October 1907. Three quiet years with little of disturbance in them. I took the natural sciences tripos, my subjects being chemistry, geology and botany. During my stay at Cambridge, the question had arisen as to what career I should take up. So the die was cast in favor of the paternal profession, the bar, and I joined the inner temple. For the next two years, I hovered about London. My law studies did not take up much time. For the rest, I simply drifted. My father wrote to me, however indulgent I may be, I am not the man to stand nonsense. Again, the idea of throwing away 40 pounds in the way you did does not commend itself to me. I replied, either you trust me or you do not. If you do, then surely no accounts are necessary. If you do not, then accounts I send you are not to be relied upon. after my return from England. Towards the end of 1912, India was politically very dull. Politics, which to me meant aggressive, nationalistic activity against foreign rule, offered no scope for this. I joined the Congress and took part in its occasional meetings. The Bunkipur Congress during Christmas of 1912 was very much an English-knowing upper-class affair, where morning coats and well-pressed trousers were greatly in evidence. Essentially, it was a social gathering with no political excitement or tension. Gokhale attended it and was the outstanding person of the session. The World War absorbed our attention. The great powers lined up in two groups, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria and Italy, and the Triple Entente of England, France and Russia. The first day of August 1914 saw the gathering and marching of the armies of Europe with the coming of the war ended the epoch of the 19th century. The majestic and calmly flowing river of Western civilization was suddenly swallowed up in the whirlpool of war. It was not India's war. She was but a dependency of Britain, forced to toe the line of her imperialist mistress. The Defense of India Act held the country in its grip. And so, in spite of large resentment in the country, Indian soldiers fought against Turks and Egyptians and others, and made India's name bitterly disliked in Western Asia. As the war proceeded, a handful of people made huge profits, but the great majority felt the strain more and more. 
the demand for more men for the front went on growing, and recruitment for the army became very intense. These methods were greatly resented by the people. Something elusive about Kamala, something fairy-like, real but insubstantial, difficult to grasp. At that time I was 26 and she was 17. Essentially she was an Indian girl and more particularly a Kashmiri girl. Sensitive and proud, childlike and grown up, wise. I have come across few persons who have produced such an impression of sincerity upon me as she did. My marriage took place in 1916 in the city of Delhi. It was on the Vasant Panchami day which heralds the coming of spring. Indira Priya Darshan, the year you were born, 1917, was one of the memorable years of history when a great leader with a heart full of love and sympathy for the poor and the suffering made his people write a noble and never to be forgotten chapter of history. In the very month in which you were born, Lenin started the great revolution. The end of the war found India in a state of suppressed excitement. Resentful, rather aggressive, not very hopeful, but still expectant. Within a few months, the first fruits of the new British policy, as eagerly awaited for, appeared. The now left bills. Instead of more freedom, there was to be more repression, with a drastic provision for arrest and trial without any of the checks and formalities. A wave of anger greeted them all over India. ourselves and take deep breaths like a beam of light that pierced the darkness and removed the scales from our eyes like a whirlwind that upset many things but most of all the working of people's minds he did not descend from the top he seemed to emerge from the millions of india speaking their language and incessantly drawing attention to them and their appalling condition the essence of his teaching was fearlessness and truth an action always keeping the welfare of the masses in view. The greatest gift for an individual or a nation, we have been told in our ancient books, was abhaya, fearlessness. Not merely bodily courage, but absence of fear from the mind. The dominant impulse under British rule was that of fear. Pervasive, oppressive, strangling fear. Fear of the official class, fear of laws made to suppress, and of prison, fear of the landlord's agent, fear of the moneylender, fear of unemployment and starvation, which were always on the threshold. It was against all this prevalent fear that Gandhiji's quiet and determined voice was raised. Be not afraid. A new technique of action was evolved, which, though perfectly peaceful, yet implied non-submission to what was considered wrong, and as a consequence, willing the acceptance of pain and suffering involved in this. The 
Congress made the decisive step and accepted the program of non-cooperation proposed by Gandhiji. It was supposed to hold boycotts, refusal of the titles given by the foreign government, boycott of official functions, boycott of courts of law, government schools and colleges. The boycott was to be spread to state and military services and the payment of taxes. As for the constructive programs, the emphasis was made on the making of khadi cloth and the creation of courts of arbitration, which would function instead of the normal courts of law. Two other important aspects of the program concerned the unity of the Hindus and Muslims and the abolition of untouchability among the Hindus. Gandhiji took the leadership in his first All India Agitation. He started the Satyagraha Sabha, the members of which were pledged to disobey the Rawlat Act. Satyagraha Day. All India Hartals and complete suspension of business. The massacre at Jallianwala Bagh. The long horror and terrible indignity of the martial law in the Punjab. A bitter sense of humiliation and passionate anger filled our people. All the unending talks of constitutional reform and Indianization of the services was a mockery and an insult when the manhood of our country was being crushed and the inexorable process of exploitation was sapping our vitality. We had become a derelict nation. In those days I realized better than at any time before how cruel and immoral imperialism was. without any will of my own into contact with peasantry. Looking at them and their misery, I was filled with shame and sorrow. Shame at my own easy-going and comfortable life and the petty politics of the city which ignored this vast multitude of semi-naked sons and daughters of India. Sorrow at the degradation and the overwhelming poverty of India. I can never forget the shock that came to me that human beings should labor thus. Get off the backs of these peasants and workers, Gandhiji told us. All of you who live by their exploitation, get rid of the system which produces this poverty and misery. Political freedom took new shape then and acquired a new content. Commenting on the unrest, the Lieutenant Governor of the United Provinces noted, The Rada of Brown says that extremist meetings have been held, preaching pure Bolshevism. CID reported, the Bolshevism idea is also spreading, that it is the cultivators who plough, sow, irrigate and reap and are thus entitled to the whole of the produce of the land. Gandhiji made Congress democratic and a mass organization. The peasants rolled in and in its new garb it began to assume the look of an agrarian organization with a strong sprinkling of middle classes. I became wholly absorbed and wrapped in the movement. In spite of the strength of my family bonds, I almost forgot my family, my wife, my daughter. Go to the villages, was the slogan, and we trudged many miles across the fields and visited distant villages and addressed peasant meetings. I experienced the thrill of the power of influencing the masses. The end of the year brought matters to a head. The Prince of Wales was coming to India and the Congress had proclaimed a boycott of all the functions in connection with his visit early in December. Mass arrests began. All the prominent Congress leaders and workers in these provinces were arrested and ordinary volunteers by the thousand went to prison. Both my father and I had been sentenced to six months imprisonment. was not 
luxury for us. It was more of a burden. The time I spent in watching the ever-shifting monsoon clouds was filled with delight and a sense of relief. I had the joy of having made almost a discovery and a feeling of escape from confinement. of man. In spite of innumerable failings, man throughout the ages has sacrificed his life and all he held dear for an ideal, for truth, for faith, for country and honor. That ideal may change, but that capacity for self-sacrifice continues and because of that, much may be forgiven to man and it is impossible to lose hope for him. In the midst of disaster, he has not lost his dignity or his faith in the values he cherished. One misses many things in prison, but perhaps most of all, one misses the sound of women's voices and children's laughter. Suddenly, we in prison learned that Gandhiji had stopped the aggressive aspects of our struggle. This was because of what had happened near the village of Chori Chora, where a mob of villagers had retaliated on some policemen by setting fire to the police station and burning half a dozen or so policemen in it. Where a remote village and a mob of excited peasants in an out-of-the-way place going to put an end, for some time at least, to our national struggle for freedom? Gandhiji wrote, My dear Jawaharlal, I assure you that if the things had not been suspended, we would have been leading not a non-violent struggle, but essentially a violent struggle. The cause will prosper by this retreat. The movement had unconsciously drifted from the right path. We have come back to our moorings. <laughs> On the last day of January 1923, all of us politicals in the Lucknow jail were discharged. Autumn 1925. My wife fell seriously ill. Further treatment in Switzerland was recommended. I welcomed the idea for I wanted to go out of India myself. My mind was befogged and no clear path was visible. And I thought perhaps if I was far from India, I could see things in a better perspective and lighten up the dark corners of my mind. Europe after more than 13 years, years of war and revolution and tremendous change. The old world I knew had expired in the blood and horror of the war and a new world awaited me. Towards the end of 1926, I happened to be in Berlin and I learned there of a forthcoming Congress of Oppressed Nationalities, which was to be held at Brussels. I was appointed the Indian Congress representative for this purpose. It was felt more and more that the struggle for freedom was a common one against the thing called imperialism. The Brussels Congress and the subsequent committee meetings of the League helped me to understand some of the problems of colonial and dependent countries. My father came to Europe. All of us, my father, my wife, my young sister and I, paid a brief visit to Moscow during the 10th anniversary celebrations of the Soviet. We were glad we went but even that glimpse was worthwhile. Pravda reported, despite the obstacles created by the British authorities, Indian delegates will attend celebrations in Moscow. In a few days, Pandit Motilal Nehru, a most prominent leader of the Indian national movement, is arriving. He will come to Moscow accompanied by his son, Jawaharlal Nehru, leader of the left wing of the Indian National Congress.
more difficult to judge her failures and achievements impartially. It interests us especially because conditions there have not been, and are not even now, very dissimilar. Both are vast agricultural countries, with only the beginnings of industrialization, and both had to face poverty and illiteracy. If Russia finds a satisfactory solution for these, our work in India is made easier. Soviet revolution has advanced human society by a great leap and has lit a bright flame which could not be smothered. In particular, I was impressed by the reports of the great progress made by the backward regions of Central Asia under the Soviet regime. Lenin looked into the future and thought only of what was to be, while other countries lay numbed under the dead hand of the past. returning from Europe in good physical and mental condition. My outlook was wider, and nationalism by itself seemed to me definitely a narrow and insufficient creed. Political freedom, independence, were no doubt essential, but they were steps only in the right direction. Without social freedom in the socialistic structure of society and the state, neither the country nor the individual could develop much. The Congress held its annual session and for the first time, stood for the national independence of India. Gandhiji wrote to me, I love you too well to restrain my pen when I feel I must write. You are going too fast. You should have taken time to think and become acclimatized. Most of the resolutions you framed and got carried could have been delayed for one year. I replied, you have described the independence resolution as hastily conceived and thoughtlessly passed. As you know, it was passed almost unanimously both in the committee and in the open congress. You have advocated very eloquently and forcefully the claims of the Daridra Narayan, the poor in India. Yet, you do not say a word against the semi-feudal zamindari system, which prevails in a great part of India, or against the capitalist exploitation of both the workers and the consumers. Gandhiji wrote back, Though I was beginning to detect some differences in viewpoint between you and me, I had no notion whatsoever of the terrible extent of these differences. I see quite clearly that you must carry on in open warfare against me and my views, for if I am wrong, I am doing irreparable harm to the country. I replied, you know how intensely I have admired you and believed in you as a leader who can lead this country to victory and freedom. I felt intensively that however much I may disagree with you, your great personality and your possession of these qualities would carry us to our goal. During the non-cooperation period, you were supreme. You were in your element, and automatically you took the right step. But since you came out of prison, something seems to have gone wrong, and you have been very obviously ill at ease. You misjudge greatly, I think, the civilization of the West, and attach too great an importance to its many failings. It is the opinion of most thinkers in the West that these defects are not due to industrialism as such, but to the capitalistic system which is based on exploitation of others. I believe you have stated that in your opinion, there is no necessary conflict between capital and labor. I think that under the capitalistic system, this conflict is unavoidable. The British government announced the dispatch of a commission to India to learn what reforms and changes in the structure of the administration were required for the future. All Indian political figures and organizations were surprised over this announcement. Meanwhile, the Simon Commission had been moving about, pursued by black flag demonstrations and hostile crowds shouting, Go back! We were stopped by the police as we approached the station. It was a tremendous hammering, and the clearness of conviction that I had had on the evening before left me. 
I felt half blinded with the blows, and sometimes a dull anger seized me and a desire to hit out. But long training and discipline held, and I did not raise a hand, except to protect my face from a blow. Besides, I knew well enough that any aggression on our part would result in a ghastly tragedy, the firing and shooting down of a large number of our men. 1928 had been full of labor disputes and strikes. 1929 carried on likewise. Bombay textile labor, miserable and militant, took the lead in these strikes. The labor movement was becoming class conscious. The government struck suddenly at organized labor by arresting some of its most prominent workers from the advanced groups. This was the beginning of the famous Mirror trial, which lasted four and a half years. The defense committee was formed, of which my father was chairman. The whole process seemed to us a farce, for whether we defended a political or labor case or not, the result was likely to be the same. The 1929 Congress was going to be held in Lahore. Gandhiji's name was recommended for the presidentship by the provincial committee. But he would not accept. At the last moment, he pressed my name forward. My election was indeed a great honor and a great responsibility for me. We have but one goal today, that of independence. Independence for us means complete freedom from British domination and British imperialism. I must frankly confess that I am a socialist and a republican, and I am no believer in modern kings of industry and princes, or in the order which produces them who have greater power over lives and fortunes of masses than even kings of old, and whose methods are as predatory as those of old feudal aristocrats. I recognize, however, that it may not be possible for a body constituted such as this National Congress and in the present circumstances of the country, to adopt a full socialist program. January the 26th was fixed as Independence Day, when a pledge of independence was to be taken all over the country. We believe that it is the inalienable right of the Indian people, as of any other people, to have freedom and to enjoy the fruits of their toil and have the necessities of life so that they may have full opportunities of growth. The British government in India has not only deprived the Indian people of their freedom, but has based itself on the exploitation of the masses and has ruined India economically, politically, culturally and spiritually. We believe, therefore, that India must sever the British connection and attain Puna Swaraj, or complete independence. Independence Day came January 26th, 1930, and it revealed to us, as in a flash, the earnest and enthusiastic mood of the country. This celebration gave the necessary impetus to Gandhiji, and he felt, with his sure touch on the pulse of the people, that the time was right for action. The great question that hung in the air was, how? How were we to begin? And the Mahatma gave the hint. Salt suddenly became a mysterious word, a word of power. The salt laws were to be broken. We were bewildered and could not quite fit in a national struggle with common salt. is on his long trek. Staff in hand, he goes along the dusty roads of Gujarat, clear-eyed and firm of step, with his faithful band trudging along behind him. Many pictures rise in my mind of this man, whose eyes were often full of laughter, and yet were pools of infinite sadness. He was the pilgrim on his quest of truth, quiet, peaceful, determined, and fearless. Thank you. 
Gandhiji was arrested on May the 5th. Father was arrested on June the 30th. I was in Nani Central Jail. On the first day of the new year, 1931, we got the news about Kamala's arrest. How I began to hate all locks and bolts and bars and walls. Sometimes a physical longing would come for the soft things in life. Friends, interesting conversation, games with children. On January the 26th, in the forenoon, I was told suddenly that my father's condition was serious and I must go home immediately. Early in the morning of February the 6th, 1931, I was watching by his bedside. He had a troublesome and restless night. Suddenly I noticed that his face drew calm and the sense of struggle vanished from it. I thought that he had fallen asleep and I was glad of it. But my mother's perceptions were keener and she uttered a cry. That was his last sleep and there was no awakening. A man of strong feelings, strong passions, tremendous pride and great strength of will. He was very far from the moderate type. His clear thinking led him to see that hard and extreme words lead nowhere unless they are followed by action appropriate to the language. He was neither meek nor mild. And again, unlike Gandhiji, he seldom spared those who differed from him. With a broad forehead, tight lips and a determined chin, he had a marked resemblance to the Roman emperors. I suppose I am partial to him, but I miss his noble presence in a world full of pettiness and weakness. I look round in vain for that grand manner and splendid strength that was his. corrupts and absolute authority corrupts absolutely and no man in the wide world today has had or has such absolute authority over such large number of people as the British Viceroy of India. The Viceroy speaks in a manner such as no Prime Minister of England or President of the United States can adopt. March 1931. Civil disobedience was still going on. There came a truce or a provisional settlement between the Congress and the government. Viceroy Irwin's pact with Gandhi. The civil disobedience movement was ended for the time being. The other and vital question of our objective of independence remained. And now I saw in the settlement that even this seemed to be jeopardized. Was it for this that our people behaved so gallantly for a year? There was nothing more to be said. The thing had been done, our leader had committed himself, and even if we disagreed with him, what could we do? Throw him over? Break from him? In my heart, there was a great emptiness as of something precious gone, almost beyond recall. Gandhiji learned indirectly of my distress. We had a long talk, and he tried to convince me that nothing vital had been lost, no surrender of principles made. To me personally, Gandhiji had always shown extraordinary kindness and consideration, and my father's death had brought him particularly near to me. He had always listened patiently to whatever I had to say, and had made every effort to meet my wishes. So I decided, not without a great mental conflict and physical distress, to accept the agreement and to work for it wholeheartedly. There appeared to me to be no middle way. 
This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. morning towards the end of August, I waved goodbye to Gandhiji. He was carried away to the Arabian Sea in far west. That was my last glimpse of him for two years. Gandhiji had gone to London as the sole representative of the Congress. Mrs. Sarojini Naidu also attended the Round Table Conference as a representative of Indian womanhood. The gulf between the Congress viewpoint and that of the British government was immense. We were not joining the round table conference to talk interminably about the petty details of a constitution. The real question was how much power was to be transferred to a democratic India. What was Gandhiji's idea of India, which he was setting up to his own wishes and ideals? I shall work for India in which the poorest shall feel that it is their country in whose making they have an effective voice. An India in which there shall be no high class and low class of people. An India in which all communities will live in perfect harmony. There can be no room in such an India for the curse of untouchability or the curse of intoxicating drinks and drugs. Women will enjoy the same rights as men. This is the India of my dreams. <laughs> the members of the Round Table Conference had been nominated by the British government. They represented groups of vested interests in India who were tied up with British imperialism and looked to it for protection. The scales were terribly loaded against us. We watched the proceedings with amazement and ever-growing disgust. In the gilded, crowded hall, Gandhiji sat a very lonely figure. His dress, or absence of it, distinguished him from all others, but there was an even vaster difference between his thought and outlook and that of the well-dressed folk around him. His was an extraordinary position. In that conference, we wondered from afar how he could tolerate it. The British government had, however, no intention of falling in with our wishes in the matter. It was constituted so as to fail. It was ever the result of the mission that brought me to London. I know that I shall carry with me the pleasantest memory of my stay in the midst of the poor people of East London. Two days after our arrest, Gandhiji landed in Bombay. January the 4th, 1932 was a notable day. It put a stop to argument and discussion. Early that morning, Gandhiji and Congress President Vallabhai Patel were arrested and confined without trial as state prisoners. Civil liberties ceased to exist. It was a declaration of a kind of state of siege for the whole of India. On that 4th of January also, our trial took place in Nani prison. I was sentenced to two years rigorous imprisonment. So we sat in Nani prison, cut off from the strife, and yet wrapped up in it in a hundred ways. We were out of it, yet in it. In Allahabad, my mother was in a procession which was stopped by the police and later charged with lachis. My mother was knocked down and was hit repeatedly on the head. When the news of this came to me, 
The thought of my frail old mother lying bleeding on the dusty road obsessed me. And I wondered how I would have behaved if I had been there. How far would my non-violent feelings have carried me? peaceful and monotonous routine in jail was suddenly upset in the middle of September 1932 by a bombshell. News came that Gandhiji had decided to fast him to death in disapproval of the separate electorate given by Ramsay MacDonald's communal award to the depressed classes. What a capacity he had to give shocks to people. If Babu died, what would India be like then? And how would politics run? There seemed to be a decay and dismal future ahead and despair seized my heart when I thought of it. And then a strange thing happened to me. I had quite an emotional crisis, and at the end of it, I felt calmer, and the future seemed not so dark. And even if Bapu died, our struggle for freedom would go on. I have come across a sonnet on the Buddha that I like. Strange how Buddha appeals to me. Buddha, Marx, Gandhi. A strange medley. away, dotted with clouds. Wonderful shapes these clouds assumed, and I never grew tired of watching them. Sometimes they would join together and look like a mighty ocean, and the rustling of the breeze through the deodars would sound like the coming in of the tide on a distant seafront. Sometimes a cloud would advance boldly upon us, seemingly solid and compact, and then dissolve in mist as it came near and finally enveloped us. spent in prison sitting alone, wrapped in my thoughts. How many seasons I have seen go by, following each other into oblivion. How many yesterdays of my youth lie buried there. And sometimes I see the ghosts of these dead yesterdays rise up, bringing poignant memories and whispering to me, was it worthwhile? There is no hesitation about the answer. I was worried by the ups and downs of Kamala's condition. In May last, she left for further treatment in Europe. On September 4, 1935, I was suddenly discharged from Almora jail as news had come that my wife's condition was critical. There was the same old brave smile on Kamala's face when I saw her, but she was too weak and too much in the grip of pain. The crisis continued and slowly drained the life out of her. Sometimes we talked a little of old times. I thought of the early years of our marriage, when with all my tremendous liking for Kamala, I almost forgot her. For then I was like a person possessed, giving myself utterly to the cause I had espoused. And yet I was far from forgetting her, and I came back to her again and again, as to a sure haven.
hundred pictures of Kamala succeeded each other in my mind. A hundred aspects of her rich and deep personality. She wanted to play her own part in the national struggle, and not by merely being a hanger-on and a shadow of her husband. She wanted to justify herself to her own self, as well as to the world. Nothing in the world would have pleased me more than this, but I was far too busy to see below the surface, and I was blind to what she looked for, and so ardently desired. Yet always there was a certain magic in our relationship. On her inexperienced shoulders fell that task of organizing our work in the city of Allahabad, when every known worker was in prison. She made up for that inexperience by her fire and energy, and within a few months she became the pride of Allahabad. Winter had come. As Christmas approached, there was a marked deterioration in Kamla's condition. Early on the morning of February the 28th, she breathes her last. My wife's death in Switzerland ended a chapter of my existence and took away from my life something that had been a part of my being. It was difficult for me to realize that she was no more, and I could not adjust myself easily. Mother's death later broke the final link with the past. I returned to India and plunged into my work. Within a few days of my return, I had to preside over the annual session of the National Congress. I am convinced that the only key to the solution of the world's problem and of India's problem lies in socialism. Socialism is, however, something even more than an economic doctrine. It is a philosophy of life, and as such also it appeals to me. But I realize that the majority in the Congress, as it is constituted today, may not be prepared to go thus far. I am advocating socialism and want to make the people understand the doctrine now, so that when political power does come, it may not be captured by the fascists. dream of unity has occupied the mind of India since the dawn of civilization. India was, it must be remembered, a country of many religions, in spite of the dominance of the Hindu faith in its various shapes and forms. Islam was to come to India both as a religious and political force. There were many Muslims in the Congress. Their numbers were large and included many able men. Most dynamic were the Ali brothers, Dr. N. A. Ansari, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. So also, on a more moderate scale, Mr. M. A. Jinnah. He had left the Congress when the organization had taken a political leap forward. The Muslim League was started in 1906 with British encouragement in order to keep away the new generation of Muslims from the National Congress. Of course, British governments in the past and the present have based their policy on creating division in our ranks. Divide and rule has always been the way of empires. We cannot complain of this, or at any rate, we ought not to be surprised by it. To ignore it and not to provide against it is in itself a mistake in one's thought. The want of clear ideas and objectives in our struggle for freedom undoubtedly helped the spread of communalism. Mr. Jinnah was able, tenacious, and not open to the lure of office. His position in the Muslim League, therefore, became unique, and he was able to command the respect which was denied to many others prominent in the League. When I was Congress President, 
I wrote to Mr. Janan on several occasions and requested him to tell us exactly what he would like us to do. I asked him what the League wanted and what its definite objectives were. Mr. Jinnah's demand was based on a new theory he had recently propounded that India consisted of two nations, Hindus and Muslims. I wrote to him, why only two nations? For if nationality was based on religion, then there were many nations in India. The time has gone by when religious groups as such can take part in political or economic struggles. That may have been the case in medieval times. It is inconceivable today. The lines of cleavage are different. They are economic. Therefore, to think in terms of communal groups functioning politically is to think in terms of medievalism. From Jinnah's two-nation theory developed a conception of Pakistan or splitting up of India. The British Parliament passed a Government of India Act in 1935. This provided for some kind of a provincial autonomy, but there were so many reservations and checks that both political and economic power continued to be concentrated in the hands of the British government. The Congress could not possibly accept the Act of 1935 as even a temporary solution of the Indian problem. It was pledged to independence and to combat the Act. Yet a majority had decided to work provincial autonomy. It had thus a dual policy, to carry on the struggle for independence and at the same time to carry through the legislature's constructive measures of reform. The agrarian question especially demanded immediate attention. In spite of our rejection of the constitution, we decided to contest elections, as this brought us into intimate touch not only with the millions of voters, but also others. Towards the end of 1936, and in the early months of 1937, my touring gathered speed. We went to that forgotten creature, the Indian peasant, and remembered that his poverty was a basic problem of India. eyes glistened, and his shrunken, starved body rose up in enthusiasm, and the wine of hope filled his veins. Changes were taking place in Europe, and Hitler and Nazism had risen. I remember how I reacted to fascism and Nazism in their early days, and not only I, but many in India. How Italy's rape of Abyssinia had sickened us. I remember how I refused a pressing invitation from Signor Mussolini to see him. Japanese aggression in China had moved India deeply and revived the age-old friendship for China. In 1938, Congress sent a medical unit consisting of a number of doctors and necessary equipment and materials to China. For several years, this wing did good work there. It is surprising how internationally minded we grew in spite of our intense nationalism. No other nationalist movement of a subject country came anywhere near this. Soon afterwards, a faraway occurrence unconnected with India affected me greatly. This was the news of General Franco's revolt in Spain. I entered into this Europe of conflict by flying straight to Barcelona. But Europe was hardly the place for peaceful contemplation 
offer light to illumine the dark corners of the mind. It was the Europe of 1938 with Mr. Neville Chamberlain's appeasement in full swing and Nazism marching over the bodies of nations, betrayed and crushed. I remained for five days in Spain and watched the bombs fall nightly from the air. There I saw much else that impressed me powerfully. And there in the midst of want and destruction and ever impending disaster, I felt more at peace with myself than anywhere else in Europe. There was light there, the light of courage and determination of doing something worthwhile. As peace is said to be indivisible in the present world, so also freedom was indivisible. And the world could not continue for long, part free, part unfree. The challenge of fascism and Nazism was in essence the challenge of imperialism. They were twin brothers with this variation, that imperialism functioned abroad in colonies and dependencies, while fascism and Nazism functioned in the same way in the home country also. If freedom was to be established in the world, not only fascism and Nazism had to go, but imperialism had to be completely liquidated. I returned from Europe, sad at heart, with many illusions shattered. In India, the old problems and conflicts continued, and I had to face the old difficulty of how to fit in with my colleagues. Matters came to a head in the Congress at the presidential elections early in 1939. Unfortunately, Morana Abul Kalam Azad refused to stand, and Subhash Chandra Bose was elected after a contest. I have known Subhash for over 20 years. He was not only brave, but had a deep love for freedom. It is an open secret that at times there were differences between us on political questions. He did not approve of any step being taken by the Congress, which was anti-Japanese or anti-Italians, and yet such was the feeling in the Congress and the country, but he did not oppose this, or many other manifestations of the Congress sympathy with China, and the victims of fascist and Nazi aggression. There was a big difference in output between him and the Congress executive, both in regard to foreign and internal matters. One of Subhash's grievances against me, which is coming out more definitely in his correspondences, is his objection to the foreign policy I have sponsored. Gandhiji was not interested in these ideological conflicts, but with his extraordinary capacity to sense the situation, felt that indiscipline was growing rapidly and chaotic forces were being let loose. He was thinking in terms of the great struggle with British imperialism and indiscipline could not be a prelude to this. resigned from the presidentship and started the forward bloc. He struggled throughout his life for independence of India, though in his own way. The fascist powers would very much like India to be a thorn in the side of England when war comes, so that they might profit by the situation we create. There is nothing that we would dislike so much as to play into the hands of the fascist powers, just as we dislike being exploited by imperialist Britain. Our anti-war policy must therefore be based on freedom and democracy and opposition to fascism and imperialism. And yet with a little twist, it might well be turned into a pro-fascist policy. And I have no doubt that you will give them due consideration. In the first place, I try to thank you most heartily for the warm and enthusiastic welcome that you have given me on the occasion... Subhash of escaped from India, in went to Germany and then to Japan. And for the assurance that you have given me of your wholehearted support, as for Subhash, I have never doubted his passion for freedom. He had no love for the Japanese, but he imagined that he could further Indian independence by allying himself with the Japanese and Germans, who were not only aggressive powers, but dangerous powers. The story of the Indian National Army, formed in Burma and Malaya during war years, under the leadership of Subhash Chandra Bose, from the abandoned ranks of the British Indian Army, spread suddenly throughout the country and evoked an astonishing enthusiasm. They became the symbols of India fighting for her freedom. They became also the symbol of unity among the various religious groups in India. For Hindu and Muslim and Sikh and Christian were all represented in the army. 
They had solved the criminal problem amongst themselves. And so why should we not do so? Munich, 1938. I watched at close quarters the difficult and intricate game of how to betray your friend and the cause you are supposed to stand for on the highest moral grounds. What surprised me most was the utter collapse in a moment of crisis of all the so-called advanced people and groups. Which bears his name upon it as well as mine. The situation in Europe in August 1939 was threatening. England and France had played false to Republican Spain and betrayed Czechoslovakia. War was declared in Europe. April came and the Norwegian debacle. May brought the horrors of Holland and Belgium. June, the sudden collapse of France and Paris, the proud and fair city, nursery of freedom, lay crushed and fallen. The Viceroy of India announced that India was also at war. One man, and he a foreigner, and a representative of a hated system, could plunge 400 millions of people into war without the slightest reference to them. There was something fundamentally wrong and rotten in a system under which the fate of these millions could be decided in this way. The Congress laid down and frequently repeated a dual policy in regard to war. But on the one hand, opposition to fascism and Nazism. There was intense sympathy with the victims of that aggression. And there was willingness to join in any war or other attempts to stop this aggression. On the other hand, there was an emphasis on the freedom of India, because that was our fundamental objective, for which we had continuously labored. We reiterated that only a free India could take proper part in such a war. The British government were bent on ignoring completely Indian opinion. Not even formal or nominal respect was shown to the people's representatives and the declared wishes of the nation. One by one, the Congress resigned and retired from office and provincial autonomy functioned no more. Concentrate 
on complete independence and the total withdrawal of the British power from India. Gandhiji spoke, I will say nothing less than freedom. Here is a mantra, a short one that I give you. The mantra is do or die. We shall either free India or die in the attempt. We shall not live to see the perpetration of our slavery. On August the 7th and 8th in Bombay, the All India Congress Committee considered and debated the resolution, the Quit India Resolution. The resolution was a reasoned argument for the immediate recognition of Indian freedom. The resolution was finally passed late in the evening of August the 8th. The reaction in the country was extraordinarily widespread.
It is true that the East, or at any rate that part of it which is called India, has been enamored of thinking, often thinking about matters which to those who consider themselves practical men seem absurd and pointless. She has always honored thought and the men of thought and refused to consider the men of the sword or possessors of money as superior to them. Even in her days of degradation, she has clung to the thought and found some comfort in it. Even today, in this money age, the influence of this tradition is marked and because of it, Gandhiji, who is not a Brahmin, can become the supreme leader of India and move the hearts of millions without force or compulsion or official position or possession of money. Perhaps this is as good a test as any of the nation's cultural background and its conscious or subconscious objective to what kind of leader does it give its allegiance. philosophy of Indian life and culture and literature, ever widening and increasing in volume and sometimes flooding the land with their rich deposits. India is like some ancient palimpsest on which layer upon layer of thought and reverie had been inscribed and yet no succeeding layer had completely hidden or erased what had been written previously. All these existed in our conscious and subconscious selves though we may not have been aware of them, and they had gone to build up the complex and mysterious personality of India. During this enormous span of years, they changed their courses sometimes, and even appeared to shrivel up, yet they preserved their essential identity. In India, we find during every period when her civilization bloomed, an intense joy in life and nature, a pleasure in the act of living. It is inconceivable that a culture or view of life based on other worldliness or world worthlessness could have produced all these manifestations of vigorous and varied life. Indeed, it should be obvious that any culture that was basically otherworldly could not have carried on for thousands of years. We can never forget the ideas that have moved our race the dreams of the Indian people through the ages, the wisdom of the ancients, their toleration of ways other than theirs, their capacity to absorb other peoples and their cultural accomplishments, to synthesize them and develop a varied and mixed culture. We will never forget them or cease to take pride in that noble heritage of ours. If India forgets them, she will no longer remain India and her joy and pride will cease to be.
war has ended in Europe and Asia. The atom bomb became the symbol of the new age. The use of this bomb and the tortuous ways of power politics brought further disillusion. The old imperialisms still functioned. June 15, Friday, 8 a.m. Ten minutes ago, we were informed that we were unconditionally released. I came from the long seclusion of prison to crowds and intense activity. The Viceroy called a conference of the Indian leaders at Simla to consider the formation of an interim government consisting of representatives of the main communities and equal proportions of what was termed caste Hindus and Muslims. in the government of India. It is with no joy in my heart that I commend these proposals to you, though I have no doubt in my mind that this is the right course. For generations we have dreamt and struggled for a free and independent, united India, but we failed in finding a solution to the communal problem, agreeable to all parties concerned, and certainly we must share the blame as we have to shoulder the consequences of this failure. five years, the Muslim League has had a clear field in India. The Congress was almost continually under ban and in prison. We have thus had no approach to the Muslim masses and they have been fed with lies both by the League and government propagandists. Mahatma Gandhi, while opposed to partition, proposed a form of self-determination whereby in the Muslim majority provinces, both Muslims and Hindus would vote on the issue of separation. Jinnah insisted that Muslims alone should vote on the question of separation, and that separation should be effected while the British were in India, and not after India had become free. On that auspicious Vijaya Dashmi Day took place the inauspicious ending of the Gandhi Jinnah talks. The British government has to decide once and for all its policy in regard to this matter. It can no longer sit on a fence. It cannot force Pakistan on India in the form demanded by Jinnah, for that certainly will lead to civil war. The Muslim League launched a direct action day on August 16th, 1946, with an immediate demand for Pakistan. Our hearts were heavy with the terrible tragedy of Calcutta, and because of the insensate strife of brother against brother. The freedom we had envisaged, and for which we had labored through generations of trial and suffering, was for the people of India, and not for one group, or class, or the followers of one religion. I am personally against the idea of division of the country, but if a representative election of the areas wish to separate themselves from India, then I shall agree to their going. It is obvious, if there is a regular partition, the different parts of India will have to cooperate with each other in a hundred different ways.
and when the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity.
But another battle no less important than what we have won still faces us. It is a battle with no outside enemy. It is a battle with our own self. In the Punjab, in both East and West, there was disaster and sorrow. There was murder and arson and looting in many places. And streams of refugees poured out from one place to another. Our foundations have been shaken and our standards seem to have disappeared. I cannot think of the people in Pakistan as strangers. They have been our countrymen and neither they nor we can rid ourselves of the past or forget our close kinship. I can assure the people of Pakistan that India has no aggressive designs against any country, least of all against Pakistan. We want Pakistan to live in peace and to progress and to have the closest ties with us. There never will be aggression from our side.
of today has achieved much, but for all its declared love for humanity, it has based itself far more on hatred and violence than on the virtues that make man human. Not mere killing, for man must die, but the deliberate and persistent propagation of hatred and falsehood, which gradually become the normal habits of the people. It is dangerous and harmful to be guided in our life's course by hatreds and aversions, for they are wasteful of energy and limit and twist the mind and prevent it from perceiving the truth. Our constitution is an expression of the democratic urge. 
the Constitution embodies fundamental rights and directed principles of policy which assure many types of freedom. Our state is a secular state which gives equal opportunity to every group, every part of the country, every state, province and area. It is not enough to talk of political unity. We must have emotional unity which does away with provincial barriers, with caste barriers, or communal or religious barriers. We stand for democracy and for socialism, not necessarily in any doctrinaire sense, but in the sense that we stand for some basic principles of socialism. We say that our aim is a socialist pattern of society, something which affects the whole community helps all the people in the country to raise their level of living and reduce the big differences that may exist. Today there is in India a certain vulgarity about the difference in people's standards. There are the very well-to-do and the very poor. It is inherent in the circumstances. You cannot get rid of that by simply cutting off the heads of the tall people. You want people to grow. You do not want to shorten all of them. The basic thing, I believe, is that wrong means will not lead to right results. And that is no longer merely an ethical doctrine, but a practical proposition. Thus, violence cannot possibly lead today to a solution of any major problems, because violence has become much too terrible and destructive. The question arises as to what our ultimate objective should be. Democracy and socialism are means to an end, and not the end itself. We talk of the good of society. Is this something apart from transcending the good of the individual composing it? The law of life should not be competition or acquisitiveness, but cooperation. The good of each contributing to the good of all. Production today is the first priority. But production by itself is not enough, for this may lead to an even greater concentration of wealth in a few hands, which comes in the way of progress, and which, in the context of today, produces instability and conflict. Therefore, fair and equitable distribution is essential for any solution of the problem. A proper land policy is essential for the progress of agriculture. We have gone some way towards achieving this, by putting an end to the Zamindari and Jagirdari systems in many states. We must complete this task, eliminate all intermediaries, and fix a limit for the size of holdings. But the main object of land reforms is a deeper one. They are meant to break up the old class structure of a society that is stagnant. The main plan is a big one, embracing innumerable activities in the country. But far bigger is the vision which draws us forward, a vision inspired by courage and hope and reasoned optimism. Let us have faith in our country and ourselves. Above all, the plan is a program of work. Let us all become partners in this great enterprise of building a new India. As I walked around the site, I thought these days the biggest temple and mosque and Gurdwara is a place where man works for the good of mankind. Which place can be greater than this? This, Baka Nangal, where thousands and lakhs of men have worked, have shed their blood and sweat, and laid down their lives as well. Where can be a greater and holier place than this, which we can regard as higher?
science and technology, encouraging it not only in its various technical fields, but to build up a scientific temper, a scientific approach to life's problems. One of the biggest things that we have done since independence is the development of our magnificent national laboratories all over India. If we had done nothing else during the last five years but the development of these laboratories, we would have had some reason to take credit for our achievement. countries for any kind of help, whether financial or mechanical. That is what is called, broadly speaking, the take-off stage. It is curious that only about three or four years ago, people talked rather vaguely about using atomic energy for power purposes, formerly the thought that it could be used for civil purposes was a kind of mental adventure. Now it is recognized that it is an economic proposition. It is clear that in the final analysis, it is the quality of the human beings that counts. We have to remember always that it is right education and good health that will lay the foundation for economic as well as cultural and spiritual progress. In the old days, the arts in India were encouraged more especially by the ruling princes and rich patrons. Now, the state has to encourage them. The state should help an academy or association but should leave it free to function as it likes. That is broadly the policy we follow in regard to the Central Arts Academies. And now the time has come for me to go away for some weeks from India and to bid you farewell for a while. I have received a large number of messages of good wishes on the eve of my departure. Those good wishes I shall carry with me and they shall keep me in good heart. Perhaps it is a good thing that for five weeks or so you will not be troubled by my speeches and broadcasts. And so, good bye to you for a while and may good fortune rest with you. Join him. India may be new to world politics and her military strength insignificant in comparison with that of the giants of our epoch. But India is old in thought and experience and has traveled through trackless centuries in the adventure of life. Throughout her long history, she has stood for peace and every prayer that an Indian raises ends with an invocation to peace. It was out of this ancient and young India that Mahatma Gandhi arose, and he taught us a technique of action that was peaceful. Yet it was effective and yielded results that led us not only to freedom, but to friendship with those with whom we were till yesterday in conflict. This is the basis and the goal of our foreign policy. We are neither blind to reality nor do we propose to acquiesce in any challenge to man's freedom from whatever quarter it may come. Where freedom is menaced, or justice threatened, or where aggression takes place, we cannot be and shall not be neutral. What we plead for and endeavor to practice in our own imperfect way is a binding faith in peace. 
and an unfailing endeavor of thought and action to ensure it. This concept of coexistence is thus basic to Indian thinking. How do you country? Yes. It's uh, full of its own problems, but particularly to give a better life to all our innumerable people. And that can only be done if there is peace. And so for us, peace is a passion. Not only a passion, but something that all our logic and mind drives us to as essential for our growth. The main purpose of the United Nations is to build up a world without war. A world based on cooperation of nations and peoples. I am equally convinced that if we aim at right ends, right means should be employed. With more and more we live under a kind of regime of terror. Terror of what? Terror of some kind of catastrophe, like war descending upon us. Some kind of disaster when nuclear weapons are used and the future of the world of the world's survival is in peril. I am no man of wisdom. I am only a person who has dabbled in public affairs for nearly half a century. Learned something from them and mostly that I have learned is how wise men often behave in a very foolish manner. In ages long past, the great son of Inda, the Buddha, said that the only real victory is one in which all are equally victorious and there is defeat for no one. In the world today, that is the only practical victory. Any other way will lead to disaster. Truth is not confined to one country or one people. It has far too many aspects for anyone to presume that he knows all. And each country and each people, if they are true to themselves, have to find out their path themselves, through trial and error, through suffering and experience. Only then do they grow. We in India have sought to formulate the principles which would govern our relations with other countries and have often spoken of them as the five principles. What are these five principles? Panchashin. They are very simple. The first one is the recognition by the countries of their independence and each other's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity. The second one is non-aggression. The third is non-interference with each other. The fourth is mutual respect and equality. And the fifth is coexistence. Our policy is neither neutral in that sense, nor passive. It is an active positive policy as well in favor of peace. Uh, holding on to certain objectives and ideals and trying in a friendly way and in a small way to influence events. We don't imagine that we can make a terrible lot of difference but sometimes when things are in the balance even a little tells. in political affairs of over half the world's population. Peaceful coexistence and non-alignment does not mean passivity of mind or action, lack of faith or conviction. It does not mean submission to what we consider evil. It is a positive and dynamic approach to such problems that confront us. We believe that each country has not only the right to freedom, but also to decide its own policy and way of life. non-aligned countries. The word non-aligned may be differently interpreted, but basically it is used with the meaning of being non-aligned with the great power blocks of the world. Non-aligned has a negative meaning, but if we give it a positive connotation, it means nations which object to lining up for war purposes, to military blocks, to military alliances and the like. 
We keep away from such an approach and we want to throw our weight in favor of peace. Millions of people believe in what is called capitalism. Millions also believe in communism. But there are many millions who are not committed to either of these ideologies and yet seek friendship with others, a better life and a more hopeful future. We did not come to the Soviet Union as strangers, for many of us have followed with deep interest the great changes and developments that have taken place in this country. We are neighbor countries and it is right that there should be a feeling of neighborliness and friendship between us for the mutual advantage of both our countries and our people. I believe also that this friendship is good for the larger causes of the world and more particularly for the most vital cause of all, the peace of the world. I saw in the Soviet Union mighty tasks undertaken and many accomplished. I saw that the field of cooperation between our two countries was rich and wide. Your Excellency's visit to India will undoubtedly help in this process of deeper understanding and cooperation. Let our coming together be because we like each other and wish to cooperate, and not because we dislike others and wish to do them injury. Let us also plan for the peaceful cooperation of different countries, for the common good and the elimination of war. When I think of the old days, how all of us here and hundreds of thousands of our countrymen, together how we toil, soaring high sometimes, in the depths of despair sometimes, and succeeded in spite of innumerable difficulties with a single desire in our hearts and all our strength behind it to complete our work. We shall never forget that day when India attained freedom after a long and hard struggle and great sufferings. A fresh wind began to blow again across the country and we decided to devote all our energies to build a new and prosperous India so that the people could move forward and strengthen the nation.
we are uh, we are the interest of there is something. I don't see any way out of your dream. I, I realize that. I don't quite let it go to lead to. What I will do in the heart of this, I will do about this. I must see. was rightly regarded the country which stood for peace. We have become standard bearers of peace in the world. But weakness goes ill together with peace. Peace can be secured by strength and endeavor and not by complacency. That way alone can peace be secured in the world and our voice can be heard with respect. avenues of settlement or the Sino-Indian differences on the border question, while taking necessary precautions against the repetition of the events of October and November 1962, it continues to follow the policy of non-alignment, peaceful coexistence and development in peace and freedom. I invite all of you, to whatever religion or party or group you may belong, to be comrades in this great struggle that has been forced upon us. I have full faith in our people and in the cause and in the future of our country. Jai Hind. Concentrating on one thing, 
and uh, it's like a lot of old boys go straight. It's not, of course, that little aspect lesson, but to some extent it remains. It has a very
We have been joint partners in great undertakings and have shared the triumphs and sorrows which inevitably accompany them. A small handful of my ashes should be thrown into the Ganga. The Ganga has been to me a symbol and a memory of the past of India running into the present and flowing on to the great ocean of the future. And though I have discarded much of past tradition and customs and am anxious that India should rid herself of all shackles that bind and constrain her and divide her people and suppress vast numbers of them and prevent the free development of the body and the spirit, though I seek all this, yet I do not wish to cut myself off from the past completely. I am proud of that great inheritance that has been and is ours, and I am conscious that I too, like all of us, am a link in that unbroken chain which goes back to the dawn of history in the immemorial past of India. That chain I would not break, for I treasure it and seek inspiration from it. The major portion of my ashes should, however, be disposed of otherwise. I want these to be carried high up into the air in an aeroplane and scattered from that height over the fields where the peasants of India toil so that they might mingle with the dust and soil of India and become an indistinguishable part of India. <laughs>